Good. So hi, everybody. Um, again, my name is Kim Smith, and I'm East Coast USA based. And a little bit about my background. I started out in fine arts, but I took an architecture 101 course and was absolutely hooked. So I, I share a kinship with you guys. I switched over to interior design, and that's what I finished up with for my major. So I definitely share your passion for um, the, the effect of the built environment can have such a profound effect on the quality of life and uh, people's lives. And I remember my professor talking about this book, the study that was done, um, where uh, an identical home, same blueprint, same footprint, same everything, was built for multiple families. And for one family, they called it heaven. It was just what they needed. But for the next family down the street, it was hell. They hated it, even though it was the same exact design. So that really impressed upon me the power and that you guys have to create something that can really enhance and enrich people's lives. So that's what attracted me to interior design in the first place. And sort of a silver lining in all of this, I know the times that we're going through right now can be really depressing. Um, but if there is one silver lining, people now more than ever are thinking about home and the value of home and their spaces, their workspaces as well, and wanting them to be even healthier and happier than they were before. So I don't know how it is over there, but here in the US, building is just going through the roof. Construction is through the roof because now more than ever, people really do want home to be their haven. So that's, that's actually a silver lining for you guys. You're gonna have a very productive and busy future. But anyway, so I started out with interior design that I worked for an architect for a while and then I switched over to a kitchen company where I became the in-house marketing coordinator and graphic designer. Um, so I also used to hire a lot of photographers. So this is like the most important thing that my professors taught me is the power of good presentation. Um, you can build the most beautiful thing in the world, but no one's going to appreciate it if they can't see it. It has to be documented and it has to be documented well. Um, so having hired a lot of photographers, I have felt bitter disappointment many times of the pictures that I get back falling completely flat. But then I would get some really good ones that were effective. And I can tell you firsthand Good photos, they sell products, and they promote your services. They do what they're supposed to do. Um, so you do have to put your investment there because you are going to be somewhat of, you know, entrepreneurs in a way. Um, until you're making it big and you're one of these, you know, star architects, no one's going to be beating down your door initially and saying, yes, you know, we want you to do our project. You're going to have to hustle and you have to you have to be very good at self promotion. So a photog photography is going to play a very big role in that. So don't underestimate the power of good presentation. And I see a lot of um, designers and architects make the mistake of they think that their work is done once the project is done. And granted, like by the time you guys get to the end of a project there, you're probably like, because it's your, your work is such a labor of love and it extends over such a, a broad span of time. I'm fortunate. I have more instant gratification. I take a picture, I do my editing, and I have something beautiful. But you guys, what do they say that creativity is 10% inspiration and then what is it, 90% perspiration? You get to do the fun part, the concept, the design in the beginning, and then it could be years of seeing through with the logistics. So by the time you get to the end of it, you're probably gonna be like, okay, let's just move on. But you can't think of it that way. You, you have to, it, it, that's really just half of it. Now you have to document what you've done and you have to actually kind of revisit your process, what you did in the very beginning and go back to what inspired you about that project in the first place, remind yourself of that and you need to feed that to us as the photographer so that we can be inspired and really draw out the heart and soul of what you've created and make sure that's coming through in photographs. So when a project is done, the next step is to get it documented and keep that momentum going. And you need to, you know, there's a lot of buzz and a lot of excitement 
um, when something new and exciting is getting built. But then once it's built, you don't want that, you don't want that to be the, the pinnacle. That needs to just be part of the crescendo. Keep that momentum going. And that's going to be your imagery and then how you use it. So think about um, finding a great photographer, obviously. And one thing I want to talk about is think about photography, not photographers. Because the reason I say that is because there are a lot of pretty pictures out there, right? A lot of pretty photography. But what do we all do on Instagram? We scroll, 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 oh, like, that's pretty. Scroll, 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 oh, like. And by the time I set my phone down, I don't remember what I've looked at, right? There are tons. We are inundated with thousands of beautiful pictures, but that's not enough just to create a beautiful picture. Um, so what's the difference? The difference is once in a while, you ever have this happen, you scroll through and then you see an image that stops you in your tracks. Something about it just grabs you. And not only do you linger on that, but then it you retain it in your memory. You walk away with it and it stays with you. That's the kind of impression that you're going to need to have to your audiences because they're just like there are a lot of photographers to choose from, there are a lot of architects to choose from. How do you pick which one? How do you convince a client to choose you? You have to stay at the top of mind and you have to create something that is gonna stick with them. So it can't just be great photography. It also has to do with the photographer. Um, so maybe I can illustrate it this way. And by the way, I'm gonna have like so many music analogies because most of my friends are musicians. So someone should count how many times I drop like a, a reference to music. So tell me at the end how many times I do that. I will. <laughs> someone do that, thank you. So just so give you, to give you an illustration, let's say that a new song comes out and you hear it a bunch of times and you kind of like it, it's okay. Um, but it sort of goes in one ear out the other. You, it doesn't really stick with you. Nothing about it really grabs you. But then maybe a few years later, another artist comes along and they completely, they bring that song to life. They cover it and you hear it and you are actually hearing it for the very first time. Have you ever had that happen? And all of a sudden you hear the lyrics and you didn't hear them before, but now it's like the artist is standing right in front of you and then and speaking to you. And it's like, it's smacking you in the face. And that same song is now grabbing you. So, but what's changed? It's the same song, same lyrics, same melody, but something is different. It's the artist. They were perceptive enough to see something or hear something in that song that maybe even the original artist didn't know was there. And they're pulling it out. And now they're giving that and translating that and expressing it to the rest of us. And all of a sudden it means something. That is what a true photographer is supposed to do. Many can take pretty pictures. That's not enough. We need to be able to speak to you. We need to be able to grab you. And we need to, we need to be able to uh, express what your designs emote. And let's face it, buildings do emote. You know, there are, there are plenty of buildings that are just, they serve pragmatic uh, purposes. They're just functional. But that's not why you're doing this, right? Why did you guys choose architecture? I, if, if your mics are on, just, oh, no, your mics aren't on. I, I can probably guess because it can affect you, you know, it does something to you, it can enrich you. So we need to see that a good photographer is going to need to understand that and appreciate, appreciate that about what you have created. And they need to process that and be able to translate it to others. So you have to find a photographer, then I'm really talking about a photographer that's a channel, not just a craftsman, again, there are many that can make pretty, pretty pictures. They have the nicest gear. They, they know how to edit. That's all great. But those are just tools. Um, my weird analogy is if you hand the finest paintbrush to a, a geek, he's not going to make art with that, right? But if you hand a stick to an artist, they can make art. So the tool doesn't matter so much. You get some photographers that sort of geek out over gear. 
really, it doesn't matter. <laughs> if you have a true artist, they can make stunning, stunning things. So you need to find a photographer that has an artist's sensibility and sensitivity. And artists are really channels. Um, what they are is they just, they kind of open themselves up and they are empaths, really. They're open channels with egos removed. Their ego is removed, so it's not about them. It's not about what I can do in this technique. And that they remove themselves so that they can kind of be receivers to what they're observing. So in our case with architectural photography, we need to experience your space and be receivers of what it's doing to us so that we can feel it, we can understand it, we can interpret it, and then somehow take that real world three-dimensional experience and somehow put it into a flat <laughs> two-dimensional image that's only about this big, right? Because most of us were on Instagram. What is that? It's 600 pixels by 600 pixels. We need to take all of that and everything that it, we feel and what that space does to us and put it into a tiny little thing like that. Um, that's a really tall order and not many are capable of doing that. Um, I can say that the, I follow very few photographers. Uh, I only follow the ones that do that, that inspire me and that have that gift. Emma is one of them, wait till you see her stuff. Um, but that's the kind of photographer that you wanna find, someone that has empathy and under actually appreciates what you do and they can be as equally passionate about it as you. And maybe even more so than you, because again, remember that original song and then the cover artist comes along? A really good photographer, actually, they might even see something in what you've done that you don't even realize that you've done. So, Because a lot of times when we're creating, we're working off of intuition. We don't even consciously know what we're doing um, until someone else points it out to us. So just a, a quick little um, anecdote. I got to meet uh, an uh, uh, architect that I've followed for years, I love him. And he did this conceptual project called XYZ. And it's, it's this structure that has forms jutting out into every axis, XYZ. And it was just conceptual, but it was super interesting. And it actually, because he puts his concepts out there, he's very good at self-promoting, it actually caught some attention and he's landed some amazing clients from that. But anyway, um, I'm like, X, Y, Z, it's such an interesting concept, all these, you know, every dimension of space, but he specified court and steel for the exterior. So what do we know about court and steel? It's oxidized steel, you know, oxidation takes place over time. So whether he realized it or not, he was also speaking to the fourth dimension time <laughs> and he didn't even know it. So I pointed that out to him. He's like, Oh my God, you're right. So photographers, I think a true artist is going to maybe even see what you don't even realize that you've done and their creative juices are just going to be percolating and they're going to bring that out in fantastic, stunning photography. So I think you need to find um, a photographer that really qualifies as an artist and has that kind of sensitivity. And the first step in the process of working with them is communicating with them. You know, I, I hate it when I get a quote request from an architect that says, hey, we've got this project, here's a few details, give us an estimate. I'm like, really? <laughs> are, you, are you gonna tell me anything? Do you, do you care about your project? I, I need to know because I care about your work. You, I, I wanna know what you've done, I can't, you know. Um, so you need to communicate to them um, and we need to be empathetic to, to what you've done and really care about and get enthused about it. So that's the first step. But once you have done that, once you have communicated to them everything that's important to you about that project, then the trust comes in. Then you have to step back and trust them. Um, because again, they're gonna be like that cover artist that comes along and sees things that maybe you don't or you didn't even imagine. You have to let their creative juices flow. So maybe you guys have had this, you know, this experience where you're trying to be creative, but there are certain things that psych you out. 
Um, you know, maybe you feel the pressure of maybe some preconceived notions and you feel like you have to live up to those and it sort of squashes your creativity. Or maybe you are comparing yourself to another designer and that psychs you out. An artist needs to have their space. They need to kind of put the blinders on and the photographers need to do that too. And in order for us to have that space unhindered and unsquashed, we, we need to have your trust. Let us do that. So once you've established that kind of relationship and rapport with one, you can, you need to step back and let them do what they do and just stand back and watch. And uh, sometimes you will be amazed. So interestingly, one of my heroes besides Emma, I, I would say my other hero, top hero is Fernando Guerra. You guys should follow him and Emma. I mean, the, they're the top in the world in my opinion. And Fernando, we were just talking about him before you guys logged on. He's Emma's hero too, I think. Um, he has this uncanny ability to make the uninteresting interesting. I mean, seriously, he can take a monolithic wall with no detail and make it fascinating with his use of, he waits for the dramatic light. He uses models, uh, maybe some props. He does some cool stuff with drone he can make something completely uninteresting, interesting. A good photographer is gonna do that for you as well. You can maybe even take some of your projects that maybe they aren't you know, quite up here, but they have some potential. A good photographer is gonna make it look kind of better than it is actually. And one of his clients, one of his architecture clients said, you know, I'm actually kind of nervous when people come and visit my building in person I'm afraid now that they're gonna be underwhelmed because you made it look so amazing. That's what a good photographer does. That's the kind of photographer that you want. They will make, they will just make it out of this world. So find someone one like that and then you've got to trust them and give them their space to be creative. Um, so what I wanna do is give you, I guess, a case in point of how effective this is. Um, I've done a variety of projects from residential to commercial and most of my clients, I come from a very traditional town. So most of my work is going to fit in more of a traditional aesthetic, a traditional vein. But this project, I really did get to stretch my wings, just like we're talking about. And my client put full faith in me and I am so grateful for it. And interestingly, and the point of all of this is you want this photography to help you find more work, right? You want it to help you def define your brand, find more work and better work because you get hired for what you put out there. If you, if you post just the kind of like sort of B-side mediocre jobs and that's what people see, that's what people are going to come to you for and hire you for. So you want to get the photography of the nicer projects, the kind of stuff that you want to pursue and do more of, that's what you need to invest in. And that's what you need to put out to the world. So this is a project where I got to do that. This is the kind of stuff that I love to photograph. And my, my client put full faith in me. And so just when I was preparing this presentation yesterday, I called the marketing person of that firm just to follow up and say, get the proof in the pudding. Are these photographs doing for you what they're supposed to do? Have they helped you find more work? Have they helped solidify your brand? Have they, have they? Yes, I, and I'm like, Whew. okay. So she said um, that this project that I'm about to show you helped solidify their brand and communicate it. That they are not just a local, and they're a small, again, I'm from Buffalo, New York. It's a small town, they, they were a small firm. They were just doing small local stuff, very kind of conservative, safe kind of design. And she says, we are, it shows that we're not just a local run of the mill firm. We can do work of a national and international caliber. That's what this set has done for them. She said, this project was a springboard moment for us. With this project, we went from being a small regional firm to a national firm. Now they have clients and projects all over the country. Um, this project has been, been their poster child for showing what they are capable of. 
um, to show that they can create any kind of mood, any kind of environment, and um, any kind of experience. Um, even though it's not representative of the, the projects that they typically do, it proves that they can, they can do anything. Um, and she used some words to sort of describe the different things that they're capable of doing, things that are inviting, restorative, peaceful, quiet, or something vibrant. So really she was describing moods, she's describing the range that they can accomplish through their design work. And the photographs that I have done for them on this project and many others shows that range of emotion. But I'm just going to share this one in particular because it's my favorite. It has, it's been published the most, um, it's been shared the most, it has won the most awards out of anything else that, I, that I've shot. Um, it's, it's, it's my personal favorite piece, probably again, because they let me, they let me do what I do. So let's see, I need to share my screen. Bear with me guys. And Kim, where it's uh, 27 minutes, just no. as a reminder. Oh, God, I am so sorry. Wow, I really That's am okay. wordy, aren't I? I didn't think I'd even take up that much. I'm just going to go through this quick. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, but this is called The House in the Woods. Take your time, look at this on your own. But this is where they really, they really trusted me. And I'm so grateful. I recommended that we use a model. It's my first time working with a model. I thought it was essential because this space jutting out here was really kind of, the materials get a little confusing and a little bit hard to understand. So using a model, it was a little bit risque, but I think it helps us to understand what that space is used for. Um, so again, and then again, this recently got published again on AP Almanac. I was so honored because some of my heroes are on there. Um, but yeah, I am so sorry I took up so much time. I really didn't think I would. No way. You're enjoying it. That's the main part. I am. Oh my gosh. I was so nervous. And, and everyone told me, once you get going, you'll be fine. I'm like, oh, they're right. I'm really long-winded. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so I will cut it off there. So that's my spiel about find, find your work is not done when the build is done. You have to keep that momentum going find a photographer that's not just a craftsman an artist to make your project sing now the next question is once you have those fantastic pictures what do you do with them so now i will hand it off because emma has, is a wealth of inform information on how to use those photographs effectively thanks thank you kim <laughs> that was awesome Okay. No, Kim is right. Like, I mean, it's very important to, I'm, I'm the opposite. I will speak so fast that you'll probably hear nothing. I'm more the Spanish type of a person. I don't know how Bulgarian is mixed with Spanish, but like, um, yeah, my name is Spanish. So there you go. So um, like, I want to do a mix. I want to talk about architecture. I want to talk about business. And I want to talk about perception and visual identity. Because at the end of the day, you need to have all of those to be successful. I work with Bjork Ingels, with Ken Gokum. I work with some of the biggest architects out there. And bottom line is what they've done is they're amazing businessmen, but it always has a story. Everybody has a story. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of my story. And if you cannot understand what I'm saying because I'm speaking too fast, just tell me to slow down. There you go, <clears throat> Alberto, you can tell me. So um, my love, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, there you go, first thing in the morning. My love for photography started when I was four years old. My dad was a film cameraman. And um, if you talk about Max, like, I mean, if you talk about the 10,000 hours and Gladwell, what Gladwell says, that we need to spend 10,000 hours being someone and, and like working really hard, like Mozart, I'm definitely not Mozart, but I definitely feel in, in our fields, like it's so important for you to know where you're going how exactly you're gonna get there. Do you know what, what you, what you wanna shift in architecture? And I know you're very young, but at the same time, nowadays, you guys are in, a, in an age where you have information on your fingertips. So I feel like at the end of the day, our visual identity starts from the moment we're born, from the light we see on our wall, from really what Kim was saying at the moment in Instagram, definitely. I mean, what do you guys do in the morning? You wake up in the morning and what do you do? 
you scroll like crazy through Instagram, or at least this is me. Um, I don't pay attention to my children. They're completely abandoned. I deal with uh, Instagram. And uh, uh, and then I go to bed and then my husband can't sleep because like, there you go, the light keeps going because like I'm still looking at, uh, at Instagram. <clears throat> I did, a, I did something called the One Image uh, recently a lecture. Uh, and I studied actually a lot of the U London universities in psychology have studied what stops our attention. What will stop our attention? What do you think? It's love, it's connection, it's peace. It's all of these things that advertising tells us. Advertising pretty much bombards us with all of these crazy images all the time. And all we want is to drink wine, to meditate with yoga and to look at architecture that is peaceful. And I don't, I don't think a lot of people understand nowadays that's like, I mean, they're trying to create forms and shapes that are so complicated. At the same time, I was, um, I was watching what on the weekend, we, I was talking to 10 architects in Vancouver because they read a lot of business books. And I was thinking, okay, what paradigm am I shifting? What is me as a person at 40? Like, I mean, you guys have more opportunities to do this earlier, but what do I want to shift in architectural photography? And do you know the, the movie that came to mind was I Am Pei, uh, Learning from the Light? And I sat there and I watched it twice. And I watched how from the simplest of shapes when he was researching uh, architecture, like how he did the, the museum in Doha, and I was thinking, this is how we need to work. We need to actually be inspired by the simple things. And um, when I was telling you how I started, like my inspiration was um, at that four or five year old uh, child, uh, my dad was, we never had enough money. Like we were one of the poor families in Bulgaria because filmmakers don't make a lot of money. So he used to black out our windows in the kitchen every night because he had a side job as a photographer. And I used to sit there and look at the image on the photo paper, how it just appeared in the developer. And I was thinking that's magic. So you need to kind of find your own magic because it gave me goosebumps. To this day, I remember the images coming up and I was thinking we've captured a moment in time. And this kind of carried me through. So I'm a very boring person. I've done photography from, from very early age and then um, I wanted to be a photojournalist because I lived in a very turbulent times in Eastern Europe. Um, I wanted to be a photojournalist. I didn't have anything to do with architecture and I moved to Paris to be unpaid intern for a while. I lived on apples most of the days uh, and uh, they shoved us in the archive, but in one of the best agencies in the world, Magnum Photo Agency. And um, we didn't have digital archives. So imagine us shoved like looking for images for articles, say Le Monde or uh, National Geographic will call and say, we need images from famine in Rwanda, or we will need images from some Romanian village. And we need to sit there, open boxes of the different photographers and look at thousands of images a day by hand. And this taught me one thing, the eye is a muscle. You cannot see enough. Like in our lifetime, we cannot see enough. You could shove yourself. I still sit in all of my architect's friends' offices and I look at images. I look at images of everyone. Like, I mean, we were talking about Baeza just now. Like, I mean, I'll do overseas. I'll look all of the, all of the architects that I'm really passionate about. And in Paris, something else happened. Corbusier happened to me. So like my uncle was an architect who I lived with. So of course, like it was mandatory rule in the house for us to be going to the Corbusier uh, buildings. And I thought, there you go. This was a man in this ornate Paris that it's so beautiful, but so old fashioned, suddenly did buildings that shook the world. They shook the world, they still do to this day. And he managed to shift the idea of what architecture and what clean lines and what simplicity is. And in a way, this is what I wanted to do suddenly. I wanted to combine photojournalism, what I was doing with, with architecture. And uh, of course this was really successful because I moved to Canada, there was no photojournalism. The only thing I could hear is a bear entered somebody's home. That was kind of the news factor here coming from Eastern Europe and from all of the craziness of like falling of communist regimes. And I know some of you have experienced things like this in your own countries. Suddenly you were, you're in this place where 
um, there is no photojournalism and nobody with all my degrees, I finished National Academy of Theater and Film Art in, uh, in Sofia and I did Magnum. So I've, I arrived with my huge portfolio of printed black and white images of people killing each other in Eastern Europe. And here in Canada, people will be like, oh, like, what is this exactly? So what's happening? So I finally found a job for $135 a 12 hour day working for Expedia, photographing hotels and resorts around the world. Talk about boot camp of architectural photography and of some crazy architectural photography. But this exposed me to so many countries in the world. And it taught me one thing, no matter what I shot, whether I shot um, like a Ramada or Super 8, I don't know whether you have them there, but imagine a two, two star hotel in the middle of nowhere America. But this hotel belonged to two people, say a couple that like for them, this is their life. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna make the best images possible because these people, this is their living, this is their life. And this has been my principle when I'm photographing architecture to the very end at the moment. I'm photographing not only to do the big projects. I mean, like, like yesterday, Bjorki posted and Big posted and everybody, we won so many awards with images that we've done in the last buildings. But for me, like I wanna go, I'm photographing um, washrooms, like really beautiful ones, public washrooms, in one of the most crazy areas of crime like that exists in, 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 to this level in, in uh, British Columbia. But I'm thinking, I'm gonna kill those washrooms. I'm gonna, those will be the best washrooms. They'll go around the world. They'll go in Architizer and everywhere possible. Um, it is the way you commit to a project that is extremely important. And I'll show you some images because like it's good to have like some visual material going while, while I'm talking. And as you can see in eight minutes, I can tell you the story of my life. Um, this is how fast I talk. We can be flexible. Gonna... If you need 10 instead of eight, it's fine. There you go. So if I have technical issues, it's your fault. It's none of mine. <laughs> So I have a combination of my work. So um, what I wanted to tell you now is, um, I mean, you've heard about the fact that all I've tried to do in my life is actually push really hard um, as an immigrant and as, um, as a person who's determined to succeed no matter what. Uh, but what I learned working with architects is the key thing for you is to understand that you first need to have visual identity. Go on Instagram, uh, pull out three images. We did this with my students. I teach in, um, in Mexico City in Central University. Uh, so the last thing we did is we talked about first visual identity. Um, the images out there are not only for you to just enjoy or to see what the latest architecture is all about. The images there are also for you to actually do visual boards. Experiment, do take three images that have shocked you the most in the last month and then have them on a board and visit, I mean, now with the lockdown, don't visit, but maybe virtually visit like um, buildings that you admire and try to find those elements. I think training your eye like this gives you an idea of what is your own style, what you're drawn to. And it, it's almost like a shortcut into exactly that type of mentality that we need to very clearly understand where we're going. The most successful architects are business people. So they understand who they are, they understand what they're going, they understand what their message is and what they do with photography and is storytelling. Like it is that we need to know what the project says, but also as Kim was saying in the sea of images, what we need to do is we need to shock the viewer. The viewer needs to say, what the hell is this? And then your project has a lot more of an option to succeed because people wanna see more. And that's it. That one image is the top of the pyramid. Your top of the pyramid then moves you to people wanting to see more of your project, people wanting to see more of you. And that's why it is a combination of you knowing who you are and knowing what the story is, what the story behind the building is. I mean, this is Vancouver House. It is the craziest building. It could be shot from angles, it can completely shock you. And this is where you this is where the photographer actually kicks in. 
but we work together. Uh, Bjork is said with his iPhone under a bridge telling me exactly what shot he was passionate about. Um, it is your baby. At the same time, you need to understand what are the most marketable parts of that baby. Uh, is it the way you're showing public? Because human element in images are, is exceptionally important. You cannot photograph a building with no one. Or you can do like Fran Silvestre does in Spain, like just in residential buildings, do one person or two people conceptualize. But this still tells a story, tells a story of shadow and light, like here. I just wanted to play with shadow and light. This is a residence. And of course I had the perfect Asian um, girl because like this is where Vancouver is, is actually primarily like it's very international. Uh, so like for me, like the play of shadow and light and that's why I love the learning from light from IMP because, um, and, and even John Posson, I follow John Posson on Instagram and like, I mean, their sen sensitivity towards light, some of the best architects do the most incredible shapes, even when they don't realize it, but they study the light, how the light hits the building. And this is what we need to capture. If your photographer hasn't captured your light, it's pointless. You're never going to create mood. You're never going to create that, that incredible feeling. So like here, we're experimenting now. We're doing low light and, and we're doing very blown out images. But in all of the images that we're creating at the moment, we're trying to create that feeling. This is a, a cemetery, minus 41 degrees Celsius. I was there for 12 hours each day. I was frozen, my hands stuck to the tripod three times, but showing it that black and that, that um, it was just showing all, all of the beauty of the lines like was important to be shown in, in that severe weather. So it is also understanding when is your project gonna shine? Some projects shine in specific times of the year, some projects shine like with specific low light, because you have to understand low light in the winter time. And there are apps which should send you specific apps that the photographers are using all the time, uh, which show you exactly how the light moves, what degrees the light is moving in as well. <clears throat> so this is in January. So you see in most of my images, you're, you're gonna see a lot, a lot of, of light used. And I think this is one of the key things that the architects actually would want from you is to catch that that atmosphere and that mood. So, um, so bottom line is what I what I want to say in this lengthy explanation is have an identity, have like very good understanding of your projects, have a good photographer, like Kim was saying, but understand that images taking images for the sake of taking images will take you absolutely nowhere. And also iPhone images are not good for anything. So use them for stories, do Instagram, do engagement like this through social media, but definitely understand that you need to put the work, <clears throat> you need to put the hours into it, and you need to understand really well who you are and what your project is all about. Because if you don't understand it, no one will, like literally no one will. And like just side notes about those projects. I mean, the work that goes into photographing a commercial project is insane. We run around opening, like, I mean, we opened the, the blinds of a 21 story building, and then we ran around turning all the lights on to light it fully. We do this with the commercial projects as well. So like everybody looks at an image and says, oh, it's beautifully lit. At the same time, the photographers, it's an insane amount of work and insane amount of detail. Uh, same with aquatics. In aquatic projects, we need to shut all the pumps so the water is completely still, like to be able to get that really striking, striking shot with the reflections. So there are a lot of subtleties. So, so like when you're looking at those images, they're not just achieved. Even, even the best photographer without your help and without the prep and without you being there explaining what's happening is not going to be able to do anything. How am I doing for time? It's okay. It's good. No worries, Emma. I'm, I'm, sp I'm speaking so fast. So, so uh, bottom line is, like, I feel um, you will enter a field where the competition is immense. Like, it is insane. Uh, for you, to, you could do a spectacular project. Spectacular project being recorded wrong is, is kind of the biggest failure you can do. So, even if this is, like, I know that it's 
unaffordable sometimes to hire some of the really, really good photographers in your area. It is unaffordable. It's worth it, to be honest, every penny. I'm not selling myself. I don't, <clears throat> I don't need work. Uh, but bottom line is, I'm just saying it from a perspective of sometimes that one image can make you or break you. And um, we enter awards all the time. And the images that win are images that are so simple and understated. And I'm on the jury of quite a lot. I'm on the jury of Architizer, of Loop Design Awards, of all of those, like on the Canadian Architectural uh, Institute Awards. And what I notice is that those subdued forms, those really clean forms at the moment are kind of the way to the future. And um, we were talking about community projects. This is the other thing. Like, I mean, I know that you're, you're doing some community projects at the moment. Um, understanding what people need and how people need to live and at all engaging with your community is extremely important as well to be able to create to create strong architecture. So yeah, this is the this is you see skins and uh, skins are one of my favorite things like this is um, this was the uh, Hong Kong, um, the new Hong Kong Opera House that was quite interesting to shoot but I'm see, I'm, I'm showing a combination of really classic architecture and really modern architecture that that we're doing as well. Yeah, I'm good. Wow. How am I doing? Fantastic, thank you. Thank you so much. Kim, you could have spoken a lot more, <laughs> but no, I have a, a ton of images and, and guys, as you're looking at the images, like, yeah, and this is the other thing, shoot in any time. Don't shoot in just in, in a beautiful sunny weather. Look at this. This is a very dramatic image and it's done in, like crazy dark skies so like the one thing experimentation is also one of the things that actually really shocks people people don't expect you to shoot in rain they don't expect you to shoot in snow they don't expect you to showcase the trash cans uh, at the back of the your beautiful project but at the same time this is exactly what they need to see they need to see the actual where the building is how the building is used and and even if their ugly side to it like they don't expect that angle so this could stop them in their tracks as well so don't only look for this spectacular flashy photography you also need to tell the story of the people like here like um this image became hugely popular we had 150,000 impressions on it on instagram and it was all because of like a bunch of friends that are drinking together so maybe this is what you need to create you need to create a space for people to feel comfortable and to feel uh, they can have their glass of wine. I keep talking about the wine the whole time. Um, so yeah, but anyways, like it would be lovely to hear your questions because at the end of the day, what you're seeing here is a combination of the work of so many, so many architects and you're seeing residential and, and probably some of the best in residential and uh, commercial in, in Canada and US. So um, I know that you're very shy to ask questions, but as you can see, we're quite open to discuss anything. And if you have questions about the architects as well and, and their work, like I'm happy, I'm happy to talk about it as well. Thank you, Emma. I mean, amazing that we can see, I mean, having the introduction from Kim, having the, the introduction also of your work from you, Emma, and seeing uh, that visual, visually, I mean, it's, it's amazing to have that conversation at the same time that we see your work. I wonder, I mean, I'm worried that now after your last bits of the presentation, all of my students are gonna start to introduce friends drinking wine in their projects or something like that. I'm not very sure about it. Uh, oh. We started with the bill today and then we end with you talking about the same. Uh, I, I think, and I would like to open this space for the students because you have seen the work. I think it has been a very uh, inspirational conversation with Kim and Emma to know about the work that they have been doing and how, how it's working in their industry and the relation with uh, um, uh, the architecture wall. Then any of you would like to ask or make any comments? The photography is terrible, terrible. What are you guys doing? Like this is, and I don't wanna hear that, please. Like, no, <laughs> I'm joking. Yes, I want to say something. Hi, my name is Amalia. Hi, Hi. I was studying photojournalism at college. That's um, at level two and now I've I got to Ravensbourne and I'm studying an access course that is like before I go on to actually choose a, a design or degree whatever degree I want to but it's just a comment for both Emma and Kim um, like because I'm not a hundred percent sure if I'm going to study I am definitely a hundred percent sure that I have a journey and a purpose 
in terms of creating because of how you guys have presented my the things today is giving me a bit of confidence and especially my friend Lola who's here as well we are just so we are so grateful for you just to help us know that there is a direction in architecture and photography and journalism so thank you it's, thank it's you. a great it's combination do you know it's a it's a great combination and and bottom line is it's all about like really finding your passions and like really killing it and I mean um, do you know, I wake up first thing in the morning and until the, the night, I always think, okay, what's next? What can I achieve next? What can I, what is the next boundary I can break? Like, and, and I know it's COVID and we're all depressed and that's why like, it is hard to see the future, but all I do all day is have this, and no matter what I'm doing, I'm listening to books. We have such knowledge, even if you're going into strategy, like, I mean, just try to learn a different field. Sun Tzu, like Art of War, like this is kind of the yes. book that I go back to like a million times. Uh, this at the same time, uh, like you could, you could like just listen to seven businesses, I mean, seven habits of successful people. This is extremely like interesting book as well. So like it's, it's we have the opportunity to actually create something of ourselves so this time is given it was given to us for a reason as well and definitely and just to add to that Kim you made three and a half music references <laughs> thank oh you. thank you <laughs> <laughs> along with my notes I made note of that that's not that bad I thought it would be worse okay thank you <laughs> I think I had was raising her hand I don't know if she still has a question uh, hi there, thank you so much for your talk today, first of all, and uh, this question is basically uh, towards Emma, and um, first of all, I really love your photography, and thank you. Like, what do you do, What do you, your story is just like one of those ones that you can't just get your head around it, but um, I also do photography, and I started photography around when I was, like, when I came to UK, uh, around when I was like 12, 13, but um, why are you so opposed to like uh, phone, like mobile photography? Uh, oh, b believe me, like I do it for primarily for for selfies, like in things like this. I feel. Do you know? Do you know where is it coming from? Um, like when when I did photography, like in the beginning when we learned photography, uh, using film or creating something that will create a little bit more patience in the way you photograph is so important. Um, like I think from a perspective of uh, iPhone, like we have like instant gratification, but sometimes we're not seeing specific things because we can take a hundred shots. So like it is more the actual process that I'm opposed to. Like I feel like we could take the iPhone and create spectacular images, but we need to have the patience. So it's more, it's not the iPhone, it is more the the whole idea of try to see it, try to see what other people don't see. And this is not gonna happen with that instantaneous click. It will happen with you feeling it in your gut, like knowing that this shot is gonna create some sort of an emotion in another human being is more important than anything else. Uh, so that's it. So no, believe me, I do stories, I do selfies, I do the whole shebang. I'm really good at marketing myself. Like, so yeah, I, I use the iPhone a lot, but it's more, learn learn how to do it thank, right, you. thank you thank you Viva. any other comments because if not i'm gonna ask a question but i i don't want i want to give the opportunity to students just in case evelyn there question hi um thank you emma and kim uh both of your work is so so beautiful as i told you i recently added that picture on my pinterest board and <laughs> so <laughs> that's gotten around thank you so I'm studying photography, I'm in my first year. And only recently I've been getting into interior and architecture photography. Do you think, and I'm still finding my path, like I'm not sure which type of photography. I also like concert photography. I like, you know, portraits and um, many other types. Do you think that um, I should, like how do I say it? If I wanna be like a successful, interior designer photographer should I only do that or like do you recommend focusing on one path or do you think you're able to focus on many and still be successful am I making sense I think so yeah um, go ahead Emma. Do you want to do 
I, yeah, I have some thoughts on there are a lot of photographers that are sort of um, jacks of all trades, but the problem is they become masters of none. So it's, I think it is kind of good to specialize in a niche. Um, and it doesn't have to be one, but master one at a time. Don't, don't try to do all of it before you haven't mastered any one of them. Um, and, and that's what I found when I used to hire photographers and my budget was very limited at my company. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to afford the, the ones that specialized in interiors and the results were not good. <laughs> so I, I would recommend specializing, master that, and then you can dabble. Yeah, same. I don't believe, I actually truly don't believe that's like, you can do multiple fields. Like you can, you can evolve, like this has happened to me. I evolved from journalism to architecture. But once I started architecture, there is nothing, I feel like, we're given so many choices nowadays that we cannot concentrate on one thing. And when you don't concentrate on one thing, your name is not going to be known for one thing. And like in every successful business, the first five years of the business, you cannot change what you're doing. That's it, period. Like you need to stick to what you're doing. Even, I mean, you might say, oh, I don't like it. But like you can, you can say this about everything. I like my coffee today in a certain way. I don't like it tomorrow the same way. Like, you know, it, you can't change constantly. Choose a path and stick to it. And once you become more and more successful, you'll see how that satisfaction out of your work is going to grow and grow and how much you're going to enjoy it. Nobody enjoys the beginning. Mm -hmm. Some right. of us do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Emma, uh, well, Kim, I have a question for you. I saw that you founded a woman architecture photography Instagram yeah. or group. What can you tell us about that? And why, why did you go ahead with that? Okay, well, the reason I did that is because women architectural photographers are a rarity. I don't know why. When I first starting to when I first started to do this, I never said to myself, I, mean, I can't do this. I'm a girl. <laughs> like <laughs> that thought never dawned on me. Um, and, and I am grateful to all the guys. I, they're the ones that have taught me. I've learned from them, but I'm like, I'm, I was wondering why is it that I only know male photographers? How come? I, so when I found Emma, talk about, and remember when I said you're scrolling, there's pretty pictures, but then there's one that stops you in your tracks. I stopped in my tracks. I'm like, Oh, who is that? And I'm like, it's a girl. <laughs> it's a girl. <laughs> and it's like so happy. And um, so we're in the minority. I, I don't, I'm not sure why, but what I suspect, and I'm going to bring this up to you guys, because I think you're going to understand being in architecture. You guys know, in the old days of the world of architecture, it was a man's world. And you have these alpha males with ginormous egos like Frank Lloyd Wright. It was a man's world. Um, some argue it still is. Um, it's definitely a lot better, but it, it still has its issues. Um, so I, I am so glad to see the diversity here. The ladies, the diversity, I, I, I'm so stoked to see that. But what I noticed was it must still be somewhat of a problem in the field because every AIA, American Institute of Architecture, every chapter that exists here in the States there's a sub chapter for women, women architects. And it's like, why do they feel the need to sort of cluster together and mentor each other and encourage each other? Well, it's because they're, they're still dealing with things that just aren't fair. They, they still are. And I, I wasn't sure if I was just being like oversensitive and, or paranoid, um, but I kind of feel like I, I kind of feel like maybe I'm dealing with that a little bit too. Maybe there's a little bit of a trickle down because in the good old days of, you know, the good old boys club with architecture, um, these guys would hire their buddy who had the fancy camera, the guy that they like to drink beer with and play golf with. And those guys get crowned the king of architectural photography in their tiny little town. And he never gets dethroned um, <laughs> because of these relationships. I am the type of person I want to rise or fall based on the merits of my work. Not because of who I know, not because of who I have a beer with, not because of my gender, not because of how I look. I don't care about any of that. I work hard to make really good images and I want to rise or fall based on that. And I think the few ladies that I have found through this group, women architectural photographers were a very small group, but you should see their work. 
and they don't get the recognition that my male counterparts do. I don't know why I'm trying to figure out why that is. I think maybe because the nature of a woman, I hope I'm not going to be too sexist in gender roles and issues here. I think, I think our nature is a little bit to be a little bit more reserved and be in the shadows a little bit. And we, we're not very good at, we're not as, as vocal about promoting ourselves. We don't present ourselves as authorities in the field as much as they do. They are not shy about that. Um, and so I think that's why all the guys are so top of mind and, and we're not. But so anyway, I created, remember before I was talking about a space an artist needs their space. So I created this little feed, women underscore arc underscore photographers on Instagram, where I'm just featuring the work of amazing, the world's top female architectural photographers and starting interviews. Um, I uh, interviewed Angie Blair. She's from Tasmania. Fantastic. This week, I'm going to be interviewing Studio Narrow. It's a two-lady team. Amazing work. You should follow them, too. So, yeah, um, we, we need our little space, and we need our little time in the sun. So that's what that feed is for. Thank you, Kim. I mean, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. That. And I could see the faces in the, in the, <laughs> the call. Like, everyone was saying, like, yeah, I know. I agree with you. Thank the, you. Great. I ha it's uh, not just me. Sophie has a question. Then uh, here we go, Sophie. Hi, sorry, my camera's not working today, unfortunately, but I am here. Um, thank you so much for your talk and your images are really beautiful. I'm, I'm wondering, it's a bit of a kind of a passion of mine and actually what I wrote my dissertation on is about, um, obviously we spend so much of our lives on Instagram. Um, we're inundated with images and photographs. And I suppose we're kind of, architectural and interior image making differs from perhaps other forms of photography is that a, a building is inhabited in real life um, as opposed to kind of only ever being a 2D representation of something. Do you think there's a, a kind of, or, or what's your opinion on the kind of responsibility of kind of architectural image makers and the line between kind of real reality and representation like you said you know sometimes the the maker of a project will be like oh I think people will be disappointed you know when they actually come because the photos made it so beautiful um do you think there's a responsibility that comes with image making yeah there, there definitely is responsibility but bottom line is <clears throat> I feel I feel um for me I always want to show that best side of the building because when you think about it, the architects go through hell. This is the other side of things. So like the client will change the parameters of the project about a hundred times. The contractor will not know what a straight line is. Um, so suddenly you're go going to projects where really the architect had this beautiful, beautiful, clean idea that has become a carbuncle of craziness because of budget cuts and because of um, of the constraints of, of what the actual structural engineer can do or what the, the builder can do. So I would counter it. I would counter this question and I always counter it because I feel the photographers are trying to do their best to showcase a building. Um, but at the same time, I feel the architect doesn't even get 1% of what they usually put into it. So at the same time, I feel it's kind of not fair for the architects overall, like what happens with their buildings. So, um, so people will be always disappointed, no matter what. There will be people that will come and say, oh, this building doesn't look good. People don't like change in tradition. They don't like change in pretty much anything. So if they see something modern and beautiful, they'll criticize the hell out of it until they'll get used to it as well. Um, so it's, it's, it always comes down to them being criticized that the photo looks better than, than the building. But at the same time, I feel people are a little bit too blind nowadays. We don't even spend the time to look at a sunrise or a sunset. We need to glimpse at a building and we need to make a judgment. So if you're doing a, like a thesis on this, just talk about the opposite side and how disadvantaged the architects are in many, many ways. That's, that's, my similar, that's similar to what you were saying before, why you're not so keen on the iPhone stuff. It's too quick and too easy, whereas our process forcefully slows it's, us down to savor what most people are going too fast to even notice. And it's almost like a meditative thing. Um, and if I can add to that, I recently talked to a guy that is a hiker. He hikes thousands of miles like he's 
hardcore. And he's like, I used to take videos of my excursions. And he's like, just, it didn't do, it didn't capture it. And he said, I noticed when I started taking still photos, it was just different. And so Emma has talked about capturing moments and capturing that stillness. And when you do that, you savor it. So I think I understand what you're saying when a photo is too good, it's almost like a bait and switch. Like, is that really honest? In a way it is because we did capture something that was really there. It's just that everyone else missed it. <laughs> Everybody else was it, sleeping because we were photographing yeah, it, at 5 a.m. in the morning. If somebody <laughs> wants to come with me at five o'clock in the morning yeah. to photograph a building, they're gonna see it in the same way that we have. So that's, right. that's the problem, it's perceptions. People, people are just terrible and that's the instantaneous, the instantaneous, everything is instantaneous nowadays. We need to just, Slow we don't down. focus on anything. We don't give energy. And, and like, if you're plugged in into so many things, how can you give energy to, to one thing? If you're plugged in into a building and you look at it for a long period of time, there's a little guy there. Um, like, I, I definitely feel, feel this, is, this is the lack of connection nowadays. We, we don't spend the time. We don't glance at each other. Every everything you can you can find knowledge of everything and visual knowledge of everything. But people didn't know I took a photo of a building. People didn't even know that this building is in Vancouver. And I'm like, how didn't you not know? It's there. It's in the center of the city. That's how little we look up nowadays. Look up or or get down. <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, some great shots, like maybe you're working with a child model or something. And you kind of get down to a child's level. How often do we off, do we really do that? When you actually change your point of view, it, it changes everything. So it's um, it is there, but people are moving too fast. We are way too like inundated with Judgy. sensory input. Judgy. It's just too much. Yeah. So it's there, but uh, you just got to slow down and change your perspective a little bit. Thank you. Savor. Thank uh, you. I am aware that we, I told you that this was going to be around an hour and we have exceeded that, but I wonder if any of the students have any last comments or questions before we finish with the session of today. How is everyone feeling after this talk? Yeah. I'm ready for my wine. <laughs> I'm ready for my wine and it's only new. I just want to say sorry for influencing it. <laughs> this whole lecture to be about wine. I actually had a quick question to ask um, uh, you, um, Emma and Kim. Um, Emma, you mentioned uh, reading, and um, I was just wondering if you guys do you guys listen to any podcasts or any like books at the moment that are like I suppose maybe motivational or something that's like sort of gives you a little push. I don't know anything that you're currently loving because I've been kind of like a podcast addict at the moment. <laughs> so I don't know, Kim. I have not yet, you know, I've listened to Barry, a friend of ours, a mutual friend, Barry McKenzie, fantastic photographer and editor um, who knows some of the top guys in the world. He started a little podcast interviewing them. So it's, it's nice to listen to them. Um, but again, I was talking about artists needs their space. I, I try not to do that too much when it comes to other photographers, because then it sort of psychs me out. Like I just, I need my space, you know, um, but uh other books, not quite yet. I'm not real good about podcasts, but I know Emma is. Emma knows See, the good I'm stuff. Just, I'm just on like yeah. true crime podcasts, but I need something a little bit more motivating. Try, tr <laughs> true crime is not helping right now. No, it's no. Oh. But it's I do. I do a ton of business books. I, I love business. I'm subscribed to one magazine and it's, well, two magazines, um, but like it's Harvard Business Review. So I know it sounds ridiculous, but I need to get my mind in a completely different direction because like, we're creatives, but at the same time, you can learn so much from how people have structured their firms, as well as, um, I mean, my biggest issue is habits. Like, like so I'm trying to kind of change my habits and the way I, I look at the world because we are all so used to tradition and we're so used to stuck in our own ways so like um definitely I'm, I'm not big on those books but seven um seven habits of successful people uh, is incredible like it talks about exactly the shifting paradigms and how exactly you can shift your own paradigms and it gives you more understanding like more higher understanding of of what you're you're about and i know you're very young for these things but if somebody told me these things when i was that age I would be so excited like change your 
paradigm. I, I, I don't think I knew what paradigm is at that point. Uh, but yeah, this is this is it. Go somewhere where it's not your field, but go somewhere where potentially it can build your farm. It can it can build you as a person. Do I did also um, a million followers for three months? Like it's a it's a book that actually shows you what you can do in the social. I will I will find the book and I'll actually send it to you because I don't know whether this is the because I listened to it about three weeks ago. Um, it's about uh, generating uh, how exactly you can uh, work the social media realm because like honestly, magazines are gonna die. Everything's gonna go online. Print is gonna die. So if you're not on top of your your online stuff, you're you're invisible. And the last thing you need nowadays is to be invisible. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I noticed. I started my own um, digital prints uh, website and I realized that unless you advertise yourself, like no one, there is no revenue, no traffic on your website, nothing. And I feel like unless your posts and, and you know, your stories are like right in someone's face, it's kind of like hearing Taylor Swift on the radio five times in in like an hour and then it kind of ingrains in your mind but I feel like yeah I know I for sure agree with that because it's so difficult to establish it yourself is. unless and, and also like think about architecture hunter do you guys know architecture hunter on Instagram I think uh, if you don't you, you should follow her she's 26 years old she's Brazilian Amanda Ferber uh, she's 26 and she sits on the table with Marcio Kogan and with everyone else in Milan because she started a website, uh, an Instagram account that actually showcases amazing architecture. So if you, if you think that's, I mean, you could be sitting in your tiny little room, wherever you are, and you could actually create something that pushes you in the world of fame in architecture because I'm sorry we could talk about beautiful architecture as much as we want to but bottom line is if you don't have that fame factor if you don't have that a little bit of a visibility to the world uh, you're not going to get the bigger project than the next bigger project like I mean you market yourself to be able to get those bigger projects that's about it so like visibility is incredible and if a 26 year old can can do it it's like we all can do it right it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Emma, because I was speaking with Amanda last week and she will probably will join I love her. in May. And she was incredibly amazing. And she would like to join just to have a, from that point of view, because as you say, like the amount of followers that she has, and she's 26 years old, and, uh, but all the conversations, all the connections that she has made, I think it would be interesting for the students to have a chat with her. And Oh, the totally. There was, a, there was a special table in Milan, a special custom table in one of the palazzos in design week. And every top architect was invited on it. And she was there. Yeah. 26 wow. years old. So I know we can, uh, a lot of times we can say, I can't do this. I can't do that. Like first thing in the morning, sometimes I'm like, I can't even get up. But at the end of the day, I feel like if we're here for a specific purpose and that purpose is not to, to be invisible. I, I have a question. Do we have just like five more minutes? I think this is such a good question for me and you guys too. You guys need to know this as future architects. I have my clients ask me, have you been published? Like it's this uh, feather in the cap. It's like this uh, credibility thing. Um, and, and Emma just mentioned and confirmed what I have been suspecting. Print is Print is going to be dead eventually. Um, we, lay, we live in an age of self-publication. Um, I, I, the more I learn about getting published in a print magazine, I see what a tremendous headache it is. Well, how tedious. Um, it takes the wind out of your sails because you pitch it, then you have to wait and wait and wait for months. And they take their sweet time getting back to you. And uh, it, it's Tell me more about that. Tell me more about the future of publication. Should should these guys and us photographers, should we really start worrying about that a whole lot about get published, get published in print? Is that a thing? It's, it's nothing to do with this anymore. It's Thank about you. the top 10 architectural <laughs> accounts on Instagram. Like, so it's about Amanda Ferber. It's about Architecture Hunter. It's about Amazing Architecture. It's about all of those. If Thank you're you. on those, if you're on those, you're everywhere because everybody reposts your work and everybody hears your name. And like, if you think about the 10 principles of marketing, I know if we talk about photography, suddenly we're talking about marketing uh, and business. 
it's all about visibility. Why my brand and why my name went around and why everybody, like, do you know, sometimes I look at my Instagram account and I see Bjorke follows me, Roshkin follows me, Marcia Coven follows me. And I'm like, I'm like, how did this happen for two years? Do you know how it happened? Really curated content online and knowing who I am and knowing my brand and knowing who are the people that I want to actually get involved with. Maybe That's I about it. And it's so simple. One, one question, because you, you, you mentioned, for example, working uh, for and with uh, Bjork Ingels, for example, but you have also mentioned working for films like Kengo Kuma. Um, uh, and when we talk about Bjork, we talk about someone that he knows very well how to sell, sell himself and sell his projects. And maybe on the other side, we talk about Kengo Kuma, about the kind of architecture that he does. Then how did you find working with this kind of, not opposite, but different approaches to the architecture world? Well, bottom line is like with, with a big is an extremely smart firm by, by, by hiring a, a chief op operations officer. They, they know very well that they can concentrate, the architects can concentrate on their work and the business people can do their work as well. Like, you know, so, so they, I, I find the, the big group is so excited about publishing and they're all online and Kai Wui and Bjorki and everyone reposts and they do stuff and I find them so engaging and this is what the future I mean when you think about it we were talking about Arthur Erickson who's one of the biggest architects in Canada like in history of Canada and um, when you think about it nobody knows his name you haven't heard who Arthur Erickson is probably but at the same time multiple generations ahead will know who Bjorki is you know, so I, I do feel like like having that like just passion towards architecture being conveyed to the world, it actually engages the general public. And this is what we need to do, engage the general public, not only, oh, I'm published in an architectural magazine that only architects will see and no one else. And that's about it. Like you need to think a broader picture. If you want to be published, say you need to go to the New York Times, you need to go to your big local newspapers. Like, why are we thinking only in architecture constrained form or interior design constraint? Or we shouldn't because the general public reads the newspaper more than they'll read the architectural magazine. <laughs> we need to really think about this as well. Um, and the, the Kengo Kuma team works. That's it. They work. Their work ethic is like 24 hours a day they're working. And in a way, like they do promotion, but not in that manner. Like, you know, they're very subdued in the way they do promotion, but their work is so incredible that just no matter what happens and they're winning some of the biggest like projects around the world. So of course you're gonna see them. And it is the type of project you're working with. I wouldn't be anywhere if, if I didn't hit those key projects suddenly, like I proved myself and I hit those key projects. Uh, to actually be bumped into into kind of the bigger league, so so this is where you need to go. You need to be very strategic. You need to have some sort of a strategy how you approach it. And 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 thinking about because we mentioned the name Fernando and Fernando Guerra and his work at, at the beginning, uh, and and Fernando hopefully will be with us next year and, and maybe it's an opportunity to see you Emma and see you Kim again uh, for another talk. Uh, I have the feeling that. Uh, Fernando that we say or you said that is the very top and I, I agree with that. Uh, I have the feeling that he has the opportunity to curate more that work about selecting the kind of clients that he wants to work with. Um, is, is that possible? Because I mean, we are talking about selling advertising business, but I'm worried that also that it doesn't have to be exactly connected sometimes with the quality of those projects. I mean, you as photographers are helping to bring the best side of that project, but sometimes we, those there are architects that they don't have that kind of, you know, uh, impact because they don't they don't do that selling. But the quality of the architecture is there, and we are missing that. Then uh, I wonder if you have any recommendations of um, architecture photographers that, in your opinion, they are very very selective with the kind of work that they photograph and or the kind of clients or etc. Okay. You're you're the better pan person to answer that than me. So have to have to and crow concentrate it's again like specializing within the specializing. Afton and crow are a London firm. They they focus on doing Zaha Hadid, doing 
uh, comes from the other question, do, do you need to profile? Even the profiled people need to profile because Hufton and Crow do not do architectural digest. And, and this is it, like even in our profession, we profile and like they've chosen to do large scale commercial projects. And honestly, it's not gonna be every project that will hit kind of the international like viewer and it will win every award. But like, if you're specialized in that field, that's, that is amazing. And they're at the top at the moment. So they can actually select who they wanna work with. Ian Ban as well, like he's one of the photographers that actually is selected to do a lot of the projects because he shows a lot more the, that side of the project that is the ugly side of the project, the more humane side of the project. And Fernando Guerra, those are like, I mean, we have a very like small group on the top and this is it. Like Captain and Crow, Fernando Guerra and Ian Van, those are the, the three people that I feel can pick and choose their projects. Like, uh, but they specialize in, Fernando does this Alvaro Cesar work and he does like uh, Fran Silvestre's work. So he's chosen simplistic lines and he's perfected it to extreme. Hefton and Crow does these huge projects like airports in China and they know how to photograph those projects. So I think, I think it's um, the people that highly profile that can do this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the, this. And I think probably it's time for put an end to the talk, but uh, before, I mean, and I'm gonna stop recording here.